Uh, shall we shall we start now, Chitu? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming here on the Tuesday traffic jam time. Um, it's really nice to see so many uh, familiar faces, uh, people that I've worked with, people that I've uh, considered mentors, um, like Li Wing Choi um, and Sao Bin, who's here on the panel with us today. Um, people I've gone to school with <laughs> and um, people I've lived with. And my parents, especially my mom, was leaning dangerously close to the artwork. So, uh, <laughs> Ma, please stand in front of the in front of the wire. Thank, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and of course, thanks to uh, Rahel, Joseph, and Ilham Gallery for so generously hosting this event. Um, it's such an important resource for a city to have a space that's always open to um, small and independent. Um, um, events that sort of need a platform and a space and an audience. Um, and before, oh, yes. So before I go on about the book, I'd like to introduce um, the three people who will discuss um, a bit about the book and also um, extra institutional practices, which is what the book is largely about. Um, Yap Saobin, who is teaching at MMU. Uh, multimedia University, yes. Uh, as a specialist staff, um, he's an artist uh, who is a member of the uh, very important uh, Ruma Ayapanas collective. And um, he's also always called upon as a mediator and interlocutor and translator as well, moving um, very easily across the, the many language groups, um, well, mainly Chinese, Malay, and English, um, and I think that's a very important resource for, for us. And he was also the facilitator of the Japan Foundation Young Curators Workshop I was a part of, and that I now no longer qualify for. <laughs> and um, very lucky and fortunate to have Ruben Kehan in town. Um, he is the curator of Asian art at Queensland Art Gallery and Modern, oh, okay. <laughs> Kagoma, <laughs> uh, where he also serves as curator for the Asia Pacific Triennial for three editions. And Rupesh Sitaran, who is also teaching at MMU, they're, they're stealing a lot of specialists there. Um, and he's an artist who, and curator and researcher with a specialization in um, uh, Malaysian art and uh, new media cultures. And he also very recent, most recently uh, co-curated uh, Climate, uh, a film and uh, video art program for the Ipoh International Art Festival, which I think my parents didn't go to. <laughs> yes, but I thought it was really important and cool. I'm from Ipoh, so yeah. And so before, um, so now they're just gonna sit pretty and look at you while you look at me, talk about um, this book, which I co-edited with uh, Rachel Rakes, who was the head curator at um, the Apple. And so I am an alumnus of the Apple curatorial program, and, uh, the, and after I graduated, uh, I was awarded the curatorial research fellowship at the Apple as well, and this is the result of the one year, uh, 10 months fellowship. And so the book is an attempt to constellate perspectives uh, of artistic initiatives, whether it's artist-run spaces, um, small para-institutional spaces, and even collectives without a physical space. Um, sort of these artistic, the, the initiatives um, that have a deep investment in local context, sort of trying to understand what is their approach to the local. And we um, looked at spaces that are distributed around the globe. We tried to strike some balance, but of course, in no way had the resource to be able to call ourselves like a global survey, and neither did we want to. Um, and it's also um, consists of different types of uh, styles of writing. Uh, initially, we only wanted to have like profiles of these sort of spaces, but eventually we ended up also having conversations and interviews with people who ran these spaces. And we also commissioned uh, texts from writers, not only sort of profiling these spaces directly, but also trying to talk about how um, people in a particular place and context 
understood the separation or the connection between a self, individual or collective, and um, the environment and the world around them. Uh, so the book is structured around three main themes. Um, and the first section is local time, and this is the first piece, which is a travelogue um, that sort of like looks at it from a perspective of a body meandering through the ground that is Lagos and um, as it drops into several art spaces. Um, local time tries to think about, discusses the implications of a time uh, duration or limitation whether it is a helpful one or a hindering one to um, such initiatives. And then there is situated infrastructure um, that tries to think about how uh, when we do locally embedded work, what are the more um, practical um, considerations as well as what are the kind of ethos that might ground these practical considerations, especially when it comes to dealing with local governments uh, and local interest groups. And um, the third section is one that I'm uh, particularly fond of. It opens with a piece by Patrick Flores and closes with my favorite piece in the book by Mirena Arsanios. I'm not supposed to have favorites as an editor, but you know. Um, yeah, so it's called Co-Translations. Um, and we sort of added, I mean, so yeah, okay, Co-Translations doesn't really exist as a word, but we, our attempt to add uh, co was to sort of um, signify that the work of translation is not is a two-way one that's about bringing tools into relations into relation and constantly in flux as opposed to translating one world into another or translating one world for um, another um, because even if uh, art spaces today are locally embedded there's always a conversation or a discussion or a desire to be to be part of a a larger picture or even a necessity. And to sort of understand where um, the desire to sort of understand these, uh, better understand the conditions of contemporary art in disparate places around the world for the Apple, which is the institution, one of the co-publishers of the book, um, necessitates a brief look at its institutional history. Oh my god, wait, I'm just checking my timer. I didn't start it, ha. Huh. All right, which I will start now. Um, so the Apple started in 1975 by uh, Wies Smalls, who worked as a librarian at the Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam, which is the municipal uh, museum of Amsterdam. And um, she was also working as a gallery di director uh, for Serial, which sells um, multiples and, and um, edition work. So it, it came about uh, to address a lack of spaces for um, time-based practices, uh, performance art uh, uh, in particular, and video art, which were forms that were at its infancy um, at the time, in 1975. And so uh, the space was really just, um, these smiles would give carte blanche to the artist to do whatever they want. Um, and so if this was the kind of space that was lacking in Amsterdam or Europe at the time. And so what happened was to, like in, 19, in the 70s to the early 80s, uh, a lot of artists that are sort of like very, uh, I wouldn't say household, very famous performance artists like Vito Akonchi, Marina Abramovic, Laurie Anderson, uh, um, Ben Darmanyak, were sort of, they, they, they did a lot of projects there. And so this is an invitation card for one of Vito Aconci's uh, um, ex exhibitions. And so these are sort of practices that are not marketable. And um, one of the conditions, and this is Vito Aconci doing a performance in Dam Square, which is a very central uh, square where the, where the old palace is. Um, and what the Apple started at that time was also a system where artists were given, uh, were paid a fee for their performances and activities, even though it was not something that, you know, like you buy. Um, and one of the conditions that allowed this to happen, and Marina Abramovich, was uh, that K KLM, uh, KLM was one of the oldest airlines, and so, and their hub is the Schiphol Airport. Um, in Amsterdam, and being a major hub, what V Smalls was able to do was, um, like for example, if Laurie Anderson was flying from 
uh, was being flown by a larger institution from Germany back to New York, she could have stopped over in Amsterdam for a couple of days and do something um, at uh, the Apple. And it was also the strong social welfare uh, state um, that is the Netherlands at the time. Uh, it was also a mecca for public housing. Um, the, there's still a pushback today, even though public housing, the situation isn't as great anymore. And also the squatting movement that started in the 60s. And this is B. Smiles in the first uh, building on Browskracht in Amsterdam. It was a, a, a former warehouse. Um, so she was averse to the idea of institutionalization, which is funny if you know what the Apple is or was just five years ago. Um, so she started by asking, constantly reflecting on the question of what art needed and what an art space like the Apple could facilitate, particularly in the city of Amsterdam or in Netherlands and maybe um, Western Europe. Um, B. Smalls passed away suddenly in a plane crash in 1983, I think, um, and uh, the board decided to uh, continue um, facilitating uh, her vision. And then Saskia Boss was appointed as um, the creative director of um, the Apple in 1984, and she was there up till 2006. So she sort of really built um, the, uh, the profile of the Apple into a much more um, international space. Um, and she sort of orientated the Apple as an alternative to the large museums like the Rijksmuseum and or more, more directly the Stedelijk Museum which also was presenting contemporary art. Um, uh, so that the Apple would be an alternative to the Stedelijk Museum and to uh, um, commercial galleries as well with a focus on um, presenting and producing new art. And uh, the other important thing that Saskia Boss initiated in 1994 was the curatorial program, which at the time was called the Curatorial Trading Program. And it was one of the first of its kind in the world. I mean, of course, today there are MA, there are even university programs, MA, BAs in curating. Um, it was not the case in 1994. And um, in 2006, when Anne de Meester took over uh, the directorship of the Apple, the sort of fast-paced growth and uh, much uh, very high visibility uh, within the national level and also international level and sort of cultivating a very broad appeal and audience was sort of the direction that the Apple took on. Um, and part of this increased visibility uh, resulted in the Apple taking on um, publishing a lot of books and journals. And this sort of visibility uh, led to a lot of collaborations, or rather, uh, I think Ander Meister thought that collaborations would be uh, uh, something very important in sort of uh, reaching uh, an international audience as well. And um, just, I think, a little before her time in 2005, the Prix de Rome, which is one of the oldest and most prestigious award for artists in the Netherlands under the age of 30, uh, 40 um, began uh, to be held uh, at the Apple. And then in 2012, they moved to, the Apple moved to Prince Hendrikade. So I think um, if you look at the slides, the location of where the Apple is is sort of constantly marked there. It's because it's sort of from a warehouse in Browskracht it moved uh, more and more and closer to the center. So by the time 2012, Prince Hendrikada is a uh, national, sort of like a cultural heritage building, and it's right in front of the central station. Um, so it's like a pretty, pretty swanky uh, neighborhood, like, you know, city center. Um, and it's a heritage building, it's got marble floors, white walls, really has a certain type of veneer and polish, although it was a very, uh, but it made it a, a very awkward um, exhibition space as this kind of like old buildings tend to be. But 2012 was also the year of severe subsidy cuts, particularly for um, smaller organizations in the Netherlands, um, because the landscape in Netherlands is that uh, 
there has always been very um, high value placed on arts and culture, and so the state um, provides very high subsidies, if not completely full sponsorship. And so uh, larger institutions like the State Lake Museum went from being completely subsidized by the government to um, 60%, and so they had to be self-sustaining. They, they have to raise their own, uh, the remaining uh, 40 or 30%. But smaller spaces really felt the hit where they were not given structural funding and only funding for the programs which you have to sort of renew and apply for every year. Structural funding is done every four years, but that one started to have like very large cuts. And sort of these cuts led to the question of what is the social value of art? Because the cuts were um, undertaken under the pretense that contemporary art is a hobby of the left wing and it does not engage with uh, the, broad, the, the public. Even though um, by, I think, about five years before 2012, there had been a steady growth in audience numbers in, in art spaces in the Netherlands. By 2014, the struggle became quite real. No, 2016. So 2014, Lorenzo, another director came in, Lorenzo Benedetti. And in 2016, he was um, very unceremoniously fired by the board of directors. Uh, and that led to um, public outcry, outcry from the arts, uh, from the arts community, particularly the collaborators and the tutors at, uh, at the Apple, which demanded that the board step down for making this um, rash uh, decision, and for, uh, and, and that this decision was based on the fact that um, Lorenzo Benedetti's programs was not seen as being uh, international enough or um, commercially sound enough. And 2006 also coincided with the rise of uh, other spaces that weren't engaged, that were sort of really looking at what the society in Netherlands at the time um, needed and how they could then approach contemporary art and engage with these different communities, being the Surinamese and the Indonesian uh, community and even the artifacts. Uh, from Indonesia and Suriname that are being held in the Netherlands. So these are the two colonies of, of the Netherlands, as well as the newer migrants from um, Morocco and Turkey. And so at that time, a new space called Frame of Frame came up, and um, the government thought that this was a more uh, deserving um, small art space, and they were they were pitched as being given the funding that the Apple would normally receive. but. I also disagree with this position of pitching art spaces against each other for state funding. But nonetheless, this led to um, the Apple asking what sort of institution it wants to be. Um, and one uh, very marked move was the fact that they had to move from the central position and location of this nice building in Prince Hendrikada all the way out to the periphery, literally, in New West. New West is kind of like at the border of Amsterdam. It's a little bit more when you're at Schiphol Airport and then you're out of Amsterdam. Um, and we are now located, and so in 2017, Niels van Thoma took over the directorship and uh, we occupy this uh, former um, primary school building, um, which the government runs as a Brutplatz, which literally translates to breeding platform, but it's arts incubator. So there are also artist studios upstairs and a couple of small institutions around. And so this sort of very visible physical shift um, led to Niels uh, Van Toma um, to sort of put in the theme of uh, inquiry for the Apple in 2017 and 18 as de-universalization. And sort of this is how we um, arrive at um, uh, the, the interest of uh, undertaking this research that led to the publication um, around art spaces, different art spaces in the world and how they approach the local. Um, I think what are the few, just to sort of round up the, sketch the landscape in Amsterdam, I think if in 1975, what artists and curators were responding to was a lack of space to exhibit and experiment, um, today what artists and curators are doing are coming together 
almost uh, becoming a, co a collective, a cooperative, even some form of unionization to improve uh, working conditions uh, and the precarity around um, being a cultural worker. Things like uh, artist fee guidelines, curator fee guidelines, uh, permanent contracts instead of like temporary freelance contracts. Um, there are several uh, of these collectives around. Platform Beka, which has successfully launched a guideline for artist fee that now the Mondrian funds, the national funding body of the Netherlands has adopted. And so, yeah, this is how we arrived at um, this uh, little publication, which I think, uh, looking at the, the catalog of books published by the Apple, um, I can only say this here, I didn't say this in um, the book launch in Amsterdam, is that there's so many out that they've published that um, talks about itself as having an international scope or view, and then you look at the content and it really just covers Paris, Berlin, Amsterdam, and m maybe, you know, one token, like a China or a, yeah, somewhere like that. Lah. And then you're like, okay. So there was a concerted effort to sort of uh, look beyond, but also there was also a limitation of uh, relying on um, our own networks, Rachel and mine. So you'll see quite a few Southeast Asian uh, names here. And um, I think I'd like to start with Ruben. Um, as a curator of Asian art, um, I think you've spoken about the importance of Asian art complicating um, the discourse of what we understand as contemporary art, which can be something, or oh, uh, up till very recently, seen as something universal, but of course from a Western perspective. And so Asian art uh, complicates a lot of these assumptions we have of what contemporary art is, what it can do, and what it can be. Um, and maybe you can speak a bit to how um, how art spaces are also changing um, how we understand uh, institutional practices or extra institutional gestures, um, and perhaps in particular with uh, Ruang Rupa, said to be the curators of the next documenta, uh, whom you've also worked with and um, contributed a piece to the book. Uh, thanks, Jolene. Yes, it's very, very uh, timely discussion, I suppose. Um, and uh, we've been uh, talking a lot just. Um, uh, behind the scenes about, um, I guess, the big question mark that sort of sits over um, Rangrupa's um, uh, directing of Documenta, what that will mean. Um, to, uh, I guess, backtrack a bit, my um, position uh, is one, I, I, for the last nine years, I've been the um, curator of contemporary Asian art at, um, at the Queensland Art Gallery, and um, a part of that job entails uh, working on the Asia Pacific Triennial, um, but I've uh, been working obviously much longer with this this question really of um, where, uh, which is really uh, framed around where I where I work, uh, which is that I work in Australia, which um, until very recently saw itself as a uh, an outpost, a colonial outpost, or a, uh, a post-colonial outpost of Europe. And um, that very much inflected um, art education uh, while I was going through art school. Um, and it, and I, I think it's really been maintained to this day, actually. Um, but the matter of fact is, is that first of all, it's a settler colonial society. Um, we're on Aboriginal land, um, land that has been um, in, inhabited for up to 100,000 years, um, with one of the oldest living cultures in the world. And uh, in addition to that, a uh, diversifying new community. So now we're at a point where 12.5% of the country actually identify as Asian or Asian Australian. Um, that's a really substantial portion of the population. Um, and yet it's not so well represented. Um, but for a long time, um, I've been working through this, um, I guess this problem of where Australia actually fits into the rest of the world. Um, and uh, when I say that Asian art, and, and I think I extend that to um, 
art forms from uh, uh, from a whole range of places outside of Europe, uh, most certainly the Pacific, um, which is in Australia's immediate neighbourhood, uh, complicates uh, this uh, hegemonic discourse um, around art production, and particularly around what art, I guess in its basic instance, looks like, but also what it means and how it actually functions within society. And uh, I think that's vitally important for Australia to actually address um, these questions, uh, A, because of sort of where it sits within the world, but B, um, because uh, it becomes a much more accurate reflection of its society. So I've been engaged in a project, uh, the Asia Pacific Triennial, which has been running um, uh, since well before I arrived at the museum. Um, in fact, it sort of it actually corresponds with my adult life. The um, first APT I saw uh, immediately before I entered art school, um, and you know then I ended up um, working on the project. Uh, but one of the conditions of cultural production in Asia is uh, a real variance of institutional infrastructures, um, not just in terms of uh, museums, but uh, education programs, uh, et cetera, um, so that you might have a context like Japan, uh, which in the 1980s embarked on a museum building boom, um, which uh, has uh, some very um, well-funded uh, programs uh, that have increasingly been engaging Southeast Asia, although they've been engaging since the 1970s, really. Um, and, uh, you know, through to China, which is a very, very emerging um, institutional structure, um, through to, uh, let's say, Singapore, um, which has, uh, you know, very uh, rapidly in the last sort of uh, 15 to 20 years, uh, and certainly very much so, in, I guess, in ex at an accelerating rate uh, over the last uh, five or ten years, um, developed enormous institutions and started amassing uh, collections. And uh, that variance is important. So when it comes to an organisation like Ruru, um, uh, who have now been in existence for 20 years, um, uh, it, it does kind of pose an interesting question. A, uh, what are Ruru doing? What will Ruru become? But B, what does it mean now for the rest of the art world that they're organising documenta? So uh, anecdotally, uh, when they were appointed, um, uh, a lot of colleagues from Europe were saying to me, oh, tell us about this Indonesian collective. What, uh, th these people who are curating documenta, what can we expect? Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot of questions there. And I, I sort of observed that um, there's a degree of a certain post-colonial wish fulfillment um, that uh, I think is actually operative within, uh, certainly within, within Europe, and that's that for a very long time um, there's been the discourse that A, documenta should be curated by an artist, B, a collective, and C, someone from outside the West, and they got all three in one. Um, uh, and I think, I think that's kind of interesting. It'd be interesting to see how Ruru actually negotiate that, that desire on the part of the audience and that expectation. But also what that will mean for collective activity more broadly in terms of um, the way that, uh, that Europe actually sort of dialogues back uh, to Asia um, and the way that that, um, that gaze, I suppose, um, operates on, on broader discussions. Um, in many ways, it's kind of academic. Um, artists have always self-organised. Um, and uh, in this part of the world, uh, certainly um, from the post-war era until now, you'll continue to see that. Um, uh, there are so many uh, collectives that actually operate without regard for what Europe might think. Um, but at the same time, it's also interesting, I guess from my perspective as somebody sitting slightly outside of Asia, um, what, uh, how that might play out in, in terms of um, the future of, I guess, how this discourse circulates. So, um, you know, these are things I'm very interested in watching over the next couple of years. Yeah, and um, I think with reading the interview that they conducted between themselves, so it's basically the piece by Ruang Rupa here is two members talking to each other, um, trying to pass the baton on about dealing with uh, funding from the Netherlands, um, from HIVOS in particular. 
uh, in Stichting Dun, where they've started this uh, collective called um, a collective of collectives, arts collaboratory that uh, brings together um, art initiatives or collectives that have a strong social focus. So this is Dune's uh, definition of what they're doing. I mean, arts collaboratories, def art collaboratories definition, and they they they, they divide um, regionally: Middle East, Asia, Africa, Latin America, Global South. Um, and Indonesia, uh, sorry, in Ruang Rupa is one of the uh, members of Arts Collaboratory. And so it's kind of nice that they're, um, and also I must say, Stichting Dun is one of the sponsors of the book. And that Farid from Ruang Rupa is not afraid to just call a spade a spade in this interview. Um, it's quite critical of what Dun is doing and quite critical of how Dun talks about. Um, a certain um, impulse to help societies in this parts of the world, but at the same time, and also talk a lot about non-hierarchical structures in how arts collabority is being run, trying to sort of learn from uh, collectives like Rang Rupa how to be more horizontal, but at the same time still uh, having this top-down, like I am the one giving you money and therefore there are certain things to, I mean, they're dealing with it, but still not, um, uh, you know, it's not uh, perfect yet, and Farid's not afraid to talk about that. Um, and I was wondering, Saubin, if you have any thoughts on that from on this being egalitarian and organizing from your days in, in uh, oh, I shouldn't say from your days because it's still on. Ro uh, ro uh, sorry. <laughs> It's not gone yet, <laughs> but uh, maybe a bit dormant, hibernating now. Uh, maybe, yeah. Okay. How many of the Rumai Panas yeah, members so are here? Oh, yeah, I think one of our previous president actually just went out. But uh, I think what is interesting to just responding to uh, what Ruben mentioned. Um, very recently, I just I was at the Jogja Binali, and Alias Wasika, the director, actually initiated a symposium. And it was actually to address that a lot of discussions um, among uh, Southeast Asia-based collective and groups right, has always been held outside of Southeast Asia in the sense that whether in Japan or in, in Taiwan, I think, or Korea as well. And in a sense, you can see the um, culture and geopolitics which is happening in the, the dynamics that coming from the different institutions from these different countries have a strong interest in bringing out the collectives or artist group or artist run some spaces to have conversation together with uh, with the host and also members of art, art collective or whatever from different countries. So in the last November, uh, Jogja Binali, so Alia initiated uh, and, and invited different, um, no, it's not necessarily representative, but just different groups from different uh, cities, Chiang Mai, Bangkok, Manila, uh, I was there, and what we think, I think, is most importantly, first thing is that we, we need to have the conversation together to really talk about uh, um, how and why, why does um, artists come together to do things. And I think one important thing I brought up, uh, I, that I, I brought back from that conversation, uh, the, there are certain imagination and desire of thinking about how a collective or artist group such as uh, Ruru or even Kunchi group, for example, that you must engage in a certain ideolog ideological or, or, or cultural politics as a way of working in curatorial or with a with institution. B but there are some groups actually from Jogja that say that no, that's not necessarily so. And I think that is interesting because in a sense that um, what we understand of uh, Jogja scene, or at least my understanding of Jogja scene, is actually much more diverse than what we see from the internet or our social, social media and things like that. And I think there's a lot of critical mass, there's a very interesting approach. And every group or everyone are coming together for different reasons, for, whether for resource sharing, um, questioning the institution, questioning the dominance or the perceived dominance of Rang Rupa, for example, as well. I think those are important things that, uh, we, uh, that there's a lot of nuance and complexity that we need to be, 
sit down together to talk about in that sense. And that is just looking at within regions. And I think that would give it a challenge to, for, for APT to think about how do we look at uh, collectivities in the sense. But I think, uh, I, if I can, may, can I have my copy back, please? This is my copy. Yeah, uh, if I can just very quickly, because how I connect to this, uh, if I can just pick up the articles that I was reading. Um, was it Emmanuel Iduma? Emmanuel, yeah, but actually in your introduction it was quite interesting that you mentioned that uh, the book is as a look at, is an attempt looking at intersection of social, economic, political and historical condition, but also as carriers of different conception of how a collective self relates to the world. And I can't help but thinking about this exhibition that we are in this space deals, about, deals with body and body politics. And it's also talking about individuals and the kind of perceived uh, formation of an institution of nationhood and things like that. And that kind of relationship. Um, individual and working as collective, working as collective with other institution is certain, there's a lot of imagination, there's a lot of uh, desire, there's a lot of uh, um, contestation as well, and negotiation, which is required. So I, I think I'm not answering your question to me about uh, working in with Rumai Banas. I think I want to look at a different way, because the first article that I, I pick up is actually by Emmanuel Idoma. Idoma, I think. Uh, and one is pretty poetic, actually. Yeah, and he was talking about describing in one of the projects that he was he undertook. And uh, uh, Emmanuel actually trained as a lawyer, but went on to work with a uh, artist group. And I think this is actually, in a way, uh, a tribute to a very important person, Bisa, right? Who just passed away yeah. last year. Bisi but... Silva. Uh, yeah. The founder of But I'm not going to read about that, but, cause, but he talks about a very uh, important part which I find kind of an affinity with that is that um, he's describing a group of them traveling as part of a research trip. So, and I quote, including Austin, the driver, the van can take 10 people. When everyone sits there, uh, when everyone sits, there is little room for more than sitting. You could recline, you could slouch face up, you could rest your forehead on the seat in front of you. The van is a place of little movement. Constrained bodies bend or stretch or attempt relaxation. Yet one passenger is rarely positioned in the same way as the next. There is a way in which 10 of us becomes, uh, become a crowd. Combined, our movements are diverse, mutable and unpredictable. So. Uh, I would like to think that the idea of artists or even cultural worker researcher working together is a collective. It's not necessary. It shouldn't be in a long duration forming into kind of institutionalized uh, platform or even organization. We should aim to, and I, I, I would like to just take up from uh, Anna Singh's uh, book, a kind of di divergent assemblage, allowing uh, differences, allowing uh, contestation, allowing um, argument, disagreement, such that that kind of different forces, different thing could grow out from there. And this is very important because uh, three important words I pick up from the first three are texts, although they speak about things quite differently, is the term intimate. I think that intimacy, not in terms of just um, human relationship, but the experience of closeness, closeness of working together, that knowledge is already important for us in a way to counter or work together as members, as human, right, within the kind of very uh, co-calculated institutionalization of, uh, or as a kind of mechanism that control a lot of us. And this is, I think, I feel very strongly when I think about a lot of friends of us who actually works in an institution, whether it's a national gallery, whether in different kind of a, a academic system and things like that, I think those are things that we need to be aware of because that would always come back to haunt us as well. And as an artist, as curator, as researcher, how do we provide that kind of support, whether in terms of intellectual, in terms of 
uh, emotive in terms of the kind of intimacy as growing together. I think that is very important. And that is also something that I pick up uh, in that symposium that we had in, 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 in Georgia, because the kind of um, uh, comradeship, the kind of, uh, uh, okay, I lost that term. Well, not intimate in a way, intimate in a different way, is very vital, I think, for practitioners. Okay. Thank you. And Rupesh, would you like to sort of pick up on sort of similar things and or divergent things from what Saubin was saying, but maybe in relation to um, what you recently did at the uh, Climate for Ipo Arts Festival? I mean, thinking about growing together in intimacy, you and uh, Hanim and the other co-curators, I think you've known each other for quite a long time and also follow each, each other's practices. Um, and then intimacy makes me think of the opposite, which is distance. And Ipo is of some distance to Kuala Lumpur. Um, it often feels further than Penang. Uh, I think you know what I mean. Um, and also thinking about, um, how to say, uh, trying to make something accessible, especially if it's called a festival and not a biennial, um, but at the same time not neglecting um, expert knowledge, particularly in something like a film program or video art. And um, yeah, so, so many questions, but yes, start anywhere you like. First of all, uh, Climate was conceived by uh, Kahanim, and I was invited to create a section for film screening. And uh, I proposed in f to curate video art, but then later on they told me to look at the film as well, local films, and to curate, to put together a bunch of films as part of their screening session uh, in conjunction with the theme of the festival called Climate. Uh, Actually, there are many layers that I want to respond. I think, I think I'll go by points. It's much more easier. At least that's the way I think. Point number one, it seems like the sort of discussion that just took place is pretty much concerned in terms of how do you deal uh, being part of an institution, both as a collective and as well as an individual. Uh, and more importantly, this institution is then being discussed in the context of some form of geopolitics, which is, it, it deals with how do you deal with globalization, being international, and as well as retaining some form of uh, locality, if you want to say. Um, and uh, based on my experience recently, I mean, I went to Singapore Biennale, I went for a residency, I was able to go to some of the Southeast Asian countries. I was dealing with some of the institutions. And reflecting that back with what took place in Ipo, one of the things that became really obvious to me is like a particular incident that took place in Ipo, whereby uh, some of the filmmakers that, that attended the festival had a very harsh criticism towards a film that was screened which is an interesting scenario. So they had this harsh criticism saying this film is no good, this film is uh, bad, and uh, it should, it's, it's so amateurish and whatnot and all this. But interestingly, a local resident came back and told me he really enjoyed the film. So what I'm trying to point out here is sometimes this whole idea of being caught up by being institutionalized actually neglects the sort of localities that you actually represent the audience itself, the context in which you are actually operating. So these people actually end up becoming representative of a particular locality, but at the moment you go on the global scale, on an international level, that local audience, what happens to them and how do, I, how I, how do you respond, what sort of responsibility you hold towards those local audience is a major concern, at least for me, it seems. Because in the global international art circuit, it seems like it's all well, there's always been a struggle, who's going to be picked up, who's going to be highlighted, what sort of desires being fulfilled, what kind of uh, 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 needs are being addressed. But nevertheless, fundamentally, how it relates to the larger world, 
how it relates to the uh, essence of locality, that somehow it feels kind of neglected to some extent, which, which I feel is kind of crucial to address. So in that sense, going back to Ruang Rupa and, uh, and uh, 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 doing the next documenta, it's interesting and I think it's really t timely, but at the same uh, moment, I'm also thinking, how is it reflected to Indonesians? What it means to the Indonesians? It's much more concern of the West, thinking like the Europe, like what it means to the West, but what it means to the Indonesian, nobody's concerned about that. When in fact, that's where they came from. That's where they're supposed to, that's why they're picked up in the first place. They are seen as an outsider, as being in the margins because they originate outside the West. Uh, so that, that is something that I think urgently need addressing. From a very small experience that I had in Ipo, thinking on a global scale, it seems like that, that's something kind of being uh, maybe not necessarily overlooked, but needs addressing importantly. And then secondly, also in terms of uh, the book, now coming back to the book, and I think some of the ideas that Saubin was telling, and I think that was clearly uh, perhaps articulated by Murph when he spoke about uh, slippage. He was trying to articulate this idea as an institution and you want to remain to be slippery. In that sense, you're not being institutionalized. You're constantly negating, trying to be slippery from becoming this institutionalized form. Uh, Interestingly, but at the same time when I read Merv's uh, interview, it seems interesting with the idea of letting go. Sometimes you have to let go. Sometimes you have to deliberately hold back certain information from becoming part of an archive, part of an institution. And that, that's an interesting proposition for me when I, when I read Merv's uh, idea of holding back instead of letting go, instead of letting everything being consumed by the institution. By the, mo by the act of holding back, it seems there is some form of negotiation of power, perhaps. But it's also, there's a question of responsibility, like, you know, as somebody who is working for an institution, as somebody who wants to see the longevity of the whatever that you're doing, and also thinking about accessibility, when you hold back, what sort of uh, limitations that you impose by doing so? Uh, and th those kind of questions also comes up. And thirdly, thinking about the audience, I think that the text by McNally, the, the luminary and counter public, that, that was, I think that was a perfect piece for me. I mean, I really enjoyed reading that, that discourse, the sort of conversation that was happening, like really, as an institution, they are really constantly struggling with this idea, how do you engage the audience? Because eventually, fundamentally, I think, as any sort of organization or institution or festival, any sort of things that we do with art, fundamentally we want to address our audience, regardless whoever that audience is. So there is this constant negotiation that's happening and I think the conversation that Luminari has talked about and the sort of transformation that they went through as an institution sets some really interesting propositions to think about like in terms of audience and in, in terms of how do you engage these sort of uh, situations. Do you, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, a, a, a couple of thoughts. Um, one, uh, just as, as, as we were talking, um, we've uh, set up an interesting relationship between collectives and institutions. Um, and uh, I was thinking about with Ruru and Green Papaya, um, one of the characteristics of them, apart from being direct contemporaries, is uh, that they're identified with particular personalities. Um, uh, three or four individuals who, you know, have been there since the start, um, or, you know, two or three in uh, Green Papaya's um, the example, and, uh, and the, they're also all men. Sorry, for and they're men, uh, with exception of Donna. Um, but the um, with, with institutions, there's there's a there's a tends to be a faster kind of a turnover of stuff. And it was interesting to, to, that you talked about uh, you went through the generations of leadership at the Apple, whereas that 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 starts to change. And um, I was. Uh, uh, thinking, uh, you know, last night a little bit, kind of about these theorizations of what an institution is, and um, 
one of the things that dis that distinguishes it from other forms of social collectivity is, of course, that the structure of the in of the institution transcends um, the relationships between the inv individuals involved with, with it, within it. Um, whereas that um, definition probably isn't as tightly drawn uh, within within collectives in general. Nevertheless, it is still a form of collectivity. Um, and it, uh, the, the specific character of an institution, uh, apart from all of the contextual things like where the money is coming from, what the society you like you live in, what your locality is, and who your direct public is, um, is uh, you know really down to the sort of people who work within it. Um, we were kind of uh, talking a little about the temptation to be anti-institutional, and I would say, especially as somebody who works in an institution, that's a very strong temptation. Um, and uh, there, there, are, there are many things to kind of be critical about institutions for, um, uh, from, from the inside I could say the kind of disciplinary nature of those structures, the way that they act on the subjectivities of uh, the people who work within them. Um, and I think that's something that you alluded to, Salvin. Um, but at the same time, coming back to this question of, lo of locality, what an institution means to its immediate public. Um, and there's actually a range of possibilities that are available there. It can be um, this, uh, you know, big, we identify them often with like large buildings, <laughs> for example, um, in the same way that we do hospitals and prisons. Um, and it could be a hospital or it could be a prison, right? Um, and uh, and you know this 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 does come down to sort of the, our political will, I suppose, as individuals. Our um, for those who want to sort of stick it out, our capacity to actually have patience to affect change, but most importantly, to actually engage the public, not simply as audiences, but actually uh, to find ways to make them active participants within uh, the program and to actually have some kind of investment um, in. In, for big state institutions in fairly affluent uh, capitals in Australia, um, we have a, a tendency to kind of uh, this default setting of, of of working for largely affluent, you know, quite educated uh, audiences. When in fact, even within our very um, uh, cities, there there are um, a lot more sort of marginal subject positions, and I think those are the things in the immediate term um, that that we actually have agency as um, institutions to be able to um, have uh, some kind of um, uh, uh, structure of community around. Yeah. Really, I think this is something museums and like institutions proper are probably picking up from the the para and the non and the anti institutions and like now um, the working group that Charles Esch is a part of um, they recently published this book um, the constituent museum and um, but I'd like to open questions to questions from the floor uh, any any comments questions for I'll pass the mic otherwise I mean, yeah, or in the meantime, think about what Malaysia might, might need or is lacking. No? Okay lah. <laughs> Any concluding remarks from our panelists? Ah, oh, we've got one. One question, sorry. Uh, I actually wanted to ask, um, funding was cut in the Netherlands um, yeah. after a time, even though there was clear proof that attendance was increasing, right? What actually caused the attendance to increase? Uh, I, I didn't study that. <laughs> oh, any idea? I can't, I, mean, I, can't, I can't speak to that with certainty or with... Uh, yeah. Um, well, uh, one, I've only started looking at this since uh, two and a half years ago when I, when I sort of arrived in, in the Netherlands. Um, I think probably for a while there has been a push uh, of um, growth for institutions to sort of have a internalized the way corporations work. Every year your audience number has to increase. Every year uh, you have to have more programs or your programs have to engage more people per, per hour or per, per program. Um, sort of that was already in place from, from um, and also for attention. Right, economy of attention. I think museums were probably 
um, I don't know if, you, if I'm, this is sort of me thinking, not, not actually quoting or having research done, but with the rise of um, biennials um, and more uh, Kunsthalles, I think then these larger institutions are also thinking about like having competition in a sense, I don't know. But I think this might be your area. I mean, I just without knowing about the situation at the Apple, um, that uh, audiences for contemporary art have been growing exponentially for the last ten years. Um, uh, of course, there is this there is this pressure to keep um, keep that audience uh, audience number up, um, and uh, sometimes they'll be very kind of uh, let's call them populist. Um, ways of, of increasing audiences. Um, but there's, a, there's an appetite um, within, let's call it the experience economy for um, engagement with contemporary art generally, not just at the big museums, but uh, certainly at the mid medium level spaces within Australia but as maybe well. Maybe learning as well, right? The turn, like education and learning in museums and spaces, maybe that increases audience numbers in some ways? Uh, it has done, and I know that my museum has actually made a concerted effort to increase the number of student groups coming through. Um, I see a lot of value in that, mm. actually. Um, much more so than um, selfie walls or, um, or Instagram friendly spots. Um, the, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in education. Um, but um, where, how that works for medium sized spaces, I'm not sure. Um, usually they don't have the resources of a, of a skilled education staff that can align with a school curriculum and network with teachers on a, on a, on a broad level, so I, I, I couldn't answer that. It's also... Actually, I just have a question. Is, uh, is the audience number a sort of measurement for the success and failure of an institution? Uh, where an institution is uh, funded by the state, um, yes. Um, to uh, often what, what institutions will do now um, is to transit, translate attendance and market research into attendance into the amount of money that people have spent while they're in the city. So it's cultural tourism becomes a... Um, oh my God, this sounds like Publica and Matt, but okay. <laughs> but this is... Yeah, this is where we're... Uh, this is, you can hire me, I can do that for this you. This is where we're at at the moment. So. Um, this is a, uh, I think it's, uh, as governments become um, more sensitive to um, the, uh, particularly press attention when it comes to public expenditure, um, they need to be able to then justify that as an investment that has a direct return. So it comes down to economics in the end. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned, could I just respond to that? Because I think um, we were talking about institution and then he's talking, uh, Rupesh mentioned about the, the audience, right? And I suppose what is connecting that is supposed to the art or the materials. Uh, I think it's important. I think the uh, Natalia Zuluka's yeah. uh, piece, they actually talk about how the, it's based on the, yeah, the Appalachian. Up, up, up Right, and it's actually... So the, um, just to think yeah, Dolly Parton songs, that's Appalachian for you. Okay, yeah, go on. and it's interesting because they mentioned that the one of the crises they had at the end is because the method of the film and documentary they, they used to, as a kind of a healing approach in, in interviewing the community that were affected because of the, the drawback of the economy. Coal mine. Yeah, and the coal mine. And yet it become a very... Um, almost useful kind of a cultural, well, I can't remember what term she used, institutionalized cultural method, right? Which means that the firm, the archive, is, has become a very proven successful method and it was used as a kind of a, a benchmark when you want to engage community using a certain method, a kind of certain type of art form and things like that. So the problem then is that when institutional or um, take up this kind of method and say, okay, it's proven successful for a duration of time, 10 years or whatever, and it can engage and do that. So we will keep on replicating that. You scale up, right? It becomes an abstract thing. And I think that is where the human value is lost. Yes. And yet at the same time, it might work if you replicate that with other communities. 
but it became it became uh, well from what I, my my reading of, of that piece that it pointed out that it became an issue within that institution, and they have to stop, mm. right? But that model works when it's being replicated in other places momentarily. Yes. So I think that is the challenge that we're thinking about uh, institu institution and institu uh, institu uh, institutionalization in the local context. And um, I still, and how do you imagine the audience in that sense? How do you measure? No, Not but but I, I'm also thinking about institution as a, as a place of uh, memory, right? It's a place that stores certain kind of historical uh, document. It's a place where you go for reference. So it also holds that burden. Uh, in your proposition, it seems like institution constantly has to reinvent itself or find innovative ways of figuring out new ways of engaging audience, for example. But at the same time, there's, it also has the burden to somehow retain some kind of documentation, some kind of residue of what worked and I, I guess that's why there's a temptation the, on the institution level to actually perpetuate or accelerate certain kind of method that works. Because it works, it's proven, it's no, it has a value, it's worth keeping, yeah. worth handing it down to the next, things like that. And then it's like when you discard and you say it's failure, it's kind of, uh, I can't imagine an institution admitting, okay, we failed. Okay, let's, our exhibition failed. Let's move on to the next exhibition. Well, they say that internally. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> You don't let on in public. It's uh, yeah, it's like cats uh, when they fight. Um, I mean, no, there's it, memory, but then there's also interpretation of yeah. these things that has to change. And I mean, I don't know the, whether it's a small institution or a large one. They have to deal with with with, with that. But yeah, sorry, Ruben. Well, I mean, saying? I guess what's what's interesting is that uh, institutions like corporations have been forced into this quarterly reporting model, um, and. Um, that's, governments have a problem with that because they can't actually invest in the long term. Um, and uh, corporations have a problem with that. Um, everybody has a problem with this, this, this acceleration of, of reporting. So what we've done is adopted a, a, um, a model from the stock market um, that was used to actually um, instruct shareholders actually how much money they were, how much their investment was increasing. But, but, but we do that throughout the public sector worldwide pretty much um, and it's a uh, that's that's a worry and I think the challenge for people working within institutions is to still be clear-sighted mm. so um, the institution has now a um, let's say a legislated responsibility to report in that way fine but as you said um, don't lose sight of these of these functions um, these uh, these memorial functions, these social functions, um, it's it's a it's a juggling act, um, but I think that balance can be struck. And I think now the balance to be struck is uh, to have dinner. Um, so if if there's uh, no more pressing remarks from our panelists and questions from the floor, I think I'll say thank you and call it an evening. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. The thank you. Final plug, a few, a few copies of the book are available today at RM60. Um, it normally retails at RM88. So, uh, yeah, grab yourself a it's, copy. It's a bargain. Yeah. At any yeah. price. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. And thank you.